All right, we're moving on to the second part of memory. In the first part, uh, you looked at some theories on memory. You learned about working memory and how it's kind of replaced the name for short-term memory. We looked at how we encoded through the, through the uh, main systems to get everything into your long-term memory. In this section, we'll look at where do we store our memories and how do we retrieve them and what are the processes involved in that. Having a memory is no good if you can't get it back out. So here are the learning objectives for this part of the of the of this unit and so you know pause have a look so you know that where we're going with this and let's continue on a lot of people think you know that memories are something that's kind of etched into your brain but what people don't remember is that your brain is actually just communicating the nerve cells it's actually electricity that passes from one nerve cell to the other via a chemical uh, which you'll learn a lot more about in Unit 2. Those of you in psych that took Psych 11 will understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but we used to believe this. And actually, there was a guy, uh, Wilder Penfield, and this was way back when, when he would do uh, probe people's brains. And as he would stimulate part of a person's brain, that they would come up with this vivid memory that they've had in the past. And so he believed that it was like that. It is recorded into your brain. It's just when we don't remember something, it's that we can't retrieve that information. However, in 1980, Elizabeth Loftus, uh, who is actually a very famous uh, memory researcher in false memories, uh, reviewed his data and it showed that only really a handful of patients rep uh, stimulated, reported these memory flashbacks. So it wasn't a lot of people. And if it was a lot of people, if you stimulated those areas and you got those nerves working, that it should trigger the memory, but it didn't. Um, and then in, in 1950, Lashley, Lashley taught rats a maze and so the rats would remember the maze and then what he would do is lesion the rat's brain which means to damage or you know to cut it pieces out or damage the rat's brain and he found out even when he did that uh, that the rats could still, still manipulate the maze if the theory was what he was testing was if, if he cut out the part of the rat's brain that where that memory was stored the rat would no longer remember it but after multiple places and everything else he determined that this memory is probably not stored in just one place and when we store, when we go through, there's a couple of brain parts that are really important. First of all, your frontal lobes are important in memories, but a really big key player is in your limbic system of your brain called the hippocampus. Um, now, when we talk about your hippocampus, it's it actually processes the memories. They're not actually stored there. It processes it, and it's like hitting a save button on your computer as it processes it into your long-term memory. Um, people with amnesia, of course, uh, most of you know that amnesia means that you can't remember something. Um, it can be because of damage to your hippocampus, could be through surgery, illness, whatever. And what we found, though, is depending on which side, you have one uh, part of your hippocampus exists in your left hemisphere and part of it in the right. But if you damage the left hemisphere, uh, you have difficulty processing memories with language, um, those types of things and, and, and facts. If you damage the right side of your hippocampus, it's more like visual type of memory that you, you cannot process. So each side of it seems to do a, a little bit different job. And also with these memories, your hippocampus seems to consolidate these things during sleep. That's why sleep is very important because during that time, uh, when we watch somebody's brain through with brain imaging, we can actually see the hippocampus kind of communicating with the lobes and it's like a conversation back and forth, and it seems to be that that's where your hippocampus is actually working on storing those memories as your the outer layer of your brain recalls those memories while you're sleeping. So sleep is important for memory. If you get don't get a lack of sleep, it's going to, your memory will suffer, and it will be better if you get a little bit more sleep. So when we look at the implicit memories, that's from the hippocampus. The implicit memories, or sorry, the explicit memories are processed through your hippocampus. Those are the ones that are declarative type of memories. Implicit memories are processed in a different area where your cerebellum is actually a big part of it. It's the big chunk of brain uh, on the back. It's like a little brain that's been stuck on there. And in fact, translated cerebellum means little brain, something like that anyways in Latin. Um, so the cerebellum along with your basal ganglia will process these implicit memories and send them to the back of your or into encode them into your long-term storage so if you can ride a bike you can thank your cerebellum and your basal ganglia um, 
something interesting is a lot of the memories that people have processed, uh, our brains aren't really developed enough until we're about three and a half or four years old. Uh, any memories before that are probably very unreliable memories because your brain hasn't really developed enough to form those long-term memories. Um, it's a term we call for those early memories is infantile amnesia. None of you remember being an infant. You may think you have memories, but those are actually false memories that your brain's created later, maybe because someone told a story or maybe because you saw pictures or you just knew about it, something has happened so your brain forms that memory at the time. But it really wasn't a memory that was consolidated from when it, the event actually happened. Um, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but very likely it didn't happen, and almost certainly it didn't happen the way you remember it. There's kind of memory out there too. It's called a flashbulb memory. If you remember us talking about Socrates, a great teacher, he used to do this thing where he would have students. He was a one-on-one -on -one teacher, and when there was an important point, he would slap the person in the face. And so every time he did that, what it did is shock the brain. And your brain's job is to, when something's important, to really pay attention because it's there to protect us. And that's what our memory's doing in this case. Um, we call these flashbulb memories. Um, they're very strong. They're less error prone, but they are still prone to error somewhat. But they're very uh, vivid. They're the most vivid memories that we kind of had. So what's happening there is if we look at the amygdala in the brain, another part of your uh, limbic system, which has a lot of basic emotions, fear and anger, those types of things. So when it's invoked, um, it seems to stimulate the the security or the, the processing of those memories so that you remember it for later. And these are the things that most often uh, are, are processed implicitly. Um, but so where is it stored in your brain? Uh, we kind of think it's kind of like a web. There's all kinds of these different connections that you make. And one of the things that we've studied, if you see that picture there, uh, this is an aplysia. An aplysia is actually a sea slug. And the reason why they look at sea slugs is, believe it or not, they can learn things. They can learn uh, classical conditioning. So, for example, if we put a drop of water on the snail and then we give it a painful electric shock, it learns to fear the water. So its brain processes it uh, much like we would do with a flashbulb memory or with any some of our implicit systems. Um, the nice thing is the aplysia only has about 20,000 brain cells uh, and they're much larger. And so they're more easy to see uh, what we of what's happening inside. And what they found is these things when conditioned. Wouldn't it suck to be a sea slug and be afraid of water, though? You got to live in there. Um, anyways, what they saw is the way these nerves communicate with other, these brain cells that we have, they're called neurons, is again, the chemical uh, neurotransmitters go from one cell to the other to uh, then create a charge into the next neuron. And when the animal learned these things, they found out that serotonin was released. So serotonin is one of those chemicals. And the receptor sites actually changed to accept the serotonin more readily. So it had potentiation uh, for more uh, efficient use of that. And that's kind of where we how we think memories work is there are these systems that we've uh, gained through long term potentiation, which sets off these webs and consolidates our memories for us. And we can see this, you know, in, in mild uh, neurocognitive disorders, where this process is interrupted, uh, and long-term potentiation is blocked, that they have difficulty remembering things as opposed to somebody who doesn't. Uh, also, we've given rats drugs to stop this process and they can't learn their way out of a maze. Uh, we've also given them drugs that actually enhance this process and they learn the maze faster and more quick, quick more quickly and faster, same thing, more efficiently. Um, which leads to say maybe one day we'll have some kind of drug that's been safe and tested that will actually help us improve our memory. That's a real thing and not a gimmicky thing you find, you know, in these little internet ads that you might run into once in a while. Uh, so when we look at the memory storage again, we got the automatic and the effortful. Um, look through this chart. It's a hierarchy. If you remember, your brain's like that. And just kind of remember on both sides the differences, the implicit memories on the automatic side, the explicit on the effortful side, where they are processed, and what are the types of things in each in each system. And it does help give you a general overview so you can fill in the details. So now that we got it stored 
through LTP or whatever method it's stored in there, we need to get the information out. Otherwise, it's useless. When we get it out, which system is it going into? We're going into the working memory. Remember, the working memory is called working memory because it's there so that we can actually use that information. So when we look at uh, memory retention and, and measuring it, uh, we look at recall and recognition kind of uh, memory. So a recall memory is just pulling facts out of air. So if you have, for example, uh, on a test, you have a short answer question or an essay question where it's open-ended, where you have to retrieve that information out of your brain, um, a lot of people have a lot more difficulty with that as opposed to a multiple choice test because in a multiple choice test the correct answer is there and it's called recognition because you can recognize the answer that has primed your brain so you can recall it um, you may have remember people you know way back from first grade or or something you don't really if we asked you you know can you name all those students unless you've been with them all the time here up until grade 12 which i doubt um, you might have trouble remembering them, but if we give you a list of names, you'd probably pick them out without any trouble. Um, for that reason, too, be, you know, when we show that, that, that recognition there, it shows that there's a brain imprint in there somewhere of that memory. And this is why relearning is a great thing. If you learn something and then forget about it, you will learn it about twice as fast. Ebbinghaus discovered this uh, when he had people learn lists of nonsense syllables and then later on test them out on that. So the relearning is an important thing. So if you play it a violin when you're six or seven years old, you pick it up later on in your life when you haven't touched it for a while, you will probably learn it a lot faster than someone who's never touched it. Um, I mentioned the word priming before. So what priming does is actually get that web of associations going in your brain. So for example, when you're looking at a picture of this rabbit in the middle of the screen, um, or we're talking about rabbits and we say the word hair, you might think of the animal. You're likely to think of the animal hair. And you're probably thinking, why are some rabbits rabbits and some rabbits hairs? I don't know, but they are. I think hairs are bigger, maybe. I don't know. But if we were talking about me, for example, and we brought up hair, you would probably think of like human hair on your head or lack thereof. So it's because you've been primed that way. So that's where the web of associations go. Uh, other things that happen is we have context dependent memory. So there are context effects. What that means is where you are when you learn something, you're more likely to retrieve it in that same environment. This can be handy on a test or something, say it's psychology, and say you read your textbook at home and you've read a fact and it comes up on a test, you can't quite recall it. So what you would do is imagine yourself in that place where you read that textbook or where you learned that concept and you're likely to pull it back out. In this experiment, it was kind of interesting because they took people and, and had them memorize a list. Um, and they, they, had, they divide the people into two groups. So when they taught on land and when they taught underneath the water and then they tested them on land and in water and as you can see by the graph if you learned it in the water you remembered it better in the water if you learned it on land you remember it better when you were tested on land um, it even goes as far as like somebody intoxicated with alcohol um, if they learn something while they're or have something to remember while they are drunk uh, they're more likely to recall it again when they are drunk this is not a study tip because they don't remember as much, but they're more likely. Drunks forget all kinds of things. Stay away from alcohol, kids. It's bad. So along with the context, kind of the same thing too, there's a, a state-dependent memory. And what that means is like the mood you're in. It's mood congruent memory. So if you're in a good mood, you're likely to recall happy things. If you're in a bad mood, you're likely to recall things that are bad or negative. So, you know, which is a horrible thing. If somebody's depressed, they're in a bad mood a lot of the time, and the things that they recall from their past are usually negative, and often they have a more negative slant than if they were in a good mood, even if it was a negative memory. But we tend to, uh, whatever mood we're in, have those memories and remember it more according to the mood that we're in today. Uh, some other things that happen, there's a serial position effect. And what that is, is say you're in a brand new class and you've got a bunch of students and no one knows each other's name. So you start by having the first person say their name and then the second person's got to say their name and the first person and you go all the way down. Well, what we would find is your memory is better for the 
first people, the people at the front, and the people at the very back. Okay, or if it's a list, you remember the first of the list or the last of the list. And the reason why I probably we'll get into in a moment, but the last grouping is called the recency effect because that was the most recent thing that you've heard. The primacy effect would be the first of that list. And that's because primary is like the first one. So it's at, at, the, at the start. 